Okay, thank you. So as Melissa said, we have two speakers at this webinar uh, this morning or this afternoon for the European people. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Rob Moritz. He received his PhD from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He then worked for 25 years at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in Melbourne together with Professor Simpson. And he was one of the pioneers of the application of micro and nano LC in proteomics research. In 2006, he set up the Australian Proteomics Computational Facility, for which he served as a director until April last year. In 2008, he moved to the Institute of System Biology in Seattle as an associate professor and also as the director of the Proteomics Center. His current research interests include the discovery of normal and disease markers in blood at the tactical, detectable levels using targeted quantitative mass spectrometry. He recently completed the Human Peptide and SRM Atlas, a quantitative atlas and community-driven rep repository of mass spectrometric assays to all human proteins. Our second speaker will be Dr. Sam Bader. He studied biochemistry at the ETH in Zurich and finished his study with a master thesis in the lab of Professor Rudy Ebersold, studying protein-protein inter actions. After his master's degree in 2007, he joined the lab of Anne-Claude Gavin at the European Molecular Biology Lab as a PhD student, focusing on the crosstalk between phosphorylation and acetylation in genome-reduced bacterium mycoplasma pneumonia. After finishing his PhD, he moved to, to the lab of Robert Moritz at, as a postdoc, where he is now working on data-independent mass spectrometry. So with that, Rob, I'd like you to uh, get started with the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Remco. And uh, just like to thank the people for joining in uh, today for this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar that we're, that we're going to give. And uh, I'd just like to uh, ask people that uh, if they have any questions, that uh, you could please um, type them down and we'll, we'll answer them at the, at the end of the session. So uh, we'll have a, a pretty good um, discussion um, from what we've been doing. And so you can you know, get, gain a bit of a, an insight into how we use the instrumentation. But the talk I'll, I'll give today is uh, um, how we uh, set up our reproducible analysis for whole proteome quantitation using the Exigent uh, Nano LC400. And I'll give you a, uh, a brief outline of uh, how we, how we uh, uh, go through this uh, talk. And so the, as part of the agenda, um, what we, uh, I'm going to talk about is just uh, uh, you know, what are the, the typical proteomic demands and, and capabilities that we uh, deal with today. Uh, how do we set up these types of experiments? Um, you know, what's the difference between you know, when we talk about shotgun mass spectrometry, then, then we uh, step into things more like targeted mass spectrometry, getting to more quantitation, and then also um, going into uh, 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 you know, more data independent analysis. Uh, so the other thing is, is can you, uh, so one thing is it will also talk about the importance of uh, chromatographic reproducibility of whole proteome connotation and then uh, talk about how the how the uh, uh, excellent nano LC uh, achieves uh, these better results a little bit faster and so one of the things that uh, we want to uh, uh, talk about then is, is how we can get our reproducibility um, to serve us a lot better and the advantages um, that we have available to us with uh, with these different systems and uh, so I just need to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. So I can advance the slide. Uh, so the first thing uh, I just want to talk about is, um, you know, what are what are the different uh, capabilities that we have available to us today? And here's a, a uh, one of the images that I've I've lent from a a, a, a recent publication, and uh, and so if we look uh, on the left hand side. We have our typical workflow where um, one uh, might want to study a uh, pathway and look at uh, an individual perturbation, um, looking at a different pathway, and then under trying to understand what uh, is changing. And so we can either use uh, shotgun mass spectrometry to, to, to produce a list of proteins and, and start to, to develop um, techniques in which we can pick out proteins that are differentially expressed or, or, or differentially modified and so we can understand what those, those real differences are. Now uh, that can get us um, very broad uh, identification. It's, uh, mass spectrometry is quite useful and 
to uh, get those, uh, those types of lists together, but it doesn't really go deep into the proteome. And so there's always this question, what are, what are we actually missing? And so we don't have that capability um, by just um, doing, doing shotgun mass spectrometry. And it can tend to be um, stochastic at times as well, where you don't get uh, uh, reproducible uh, identifications occurring. And so the development really has been that we, what would be the next step is you could take the the mass spectrometer and, and start to do more of a targeted approach by by doing uh, inclusion lists. So you you would say, okay, I'm interested in in these particular proteins, and so I can now take the molecular masses of the of the peptide that I want and and direct the mass spectrometer to uh, pick out those preferentially within that cr that chromatographic run. Uh, there doesn't have to be much reproducibility in the chromatographic run because you're really telling the mass spectrometer to pick out those peptides in preference to everything else there. But if, if it's not finding those, then, then go ahead and, and pick everything else that's there. So that gives you a little bit deeper into the, into the proteome, uh, but you lose a little bit uh, in breadth of, of, of your identification. Uh, so over the last um, uh, four years, we've been developing what we call targeted proteomic techniques. And so it, that kind of technology, what we need to do is to actually understand what are each of the um, uh, peptides, the best uh, uh, high-flying peptides, or what we call proteotypic, which would uh, uniquely identify that protein and would be most likely to be seen in a mass spectrometer. And so by that stage, that we, we then have to understand how does that particular peptide fragment. And so we need to create what we call these spectral maps. And so we need to have um, full fragmentation capabilities on, on all peptides that are present and understand which ones are the best transitions to use, which ones are the best peptides to use per protein. And that enables us to do what we call this targeted or selection reaction monitoring, or, or you might also know it as multiple reaction monitoring, in where we now program the mass spectrometer to specifically look at uh, those, those particular um, peptides of interest uh, at the behest of all the others. And so you don't have that uh, uh, capability of looking at everything else anymore. Um, one of the things that, that happens, though, is that you don't get that breadth anymore, but you do get that very deep um, uh, analysis. And so if you, if you start to do your network type analysis, and that's one of the um, major uh, strengths that we have here at ISB is to, is to start to process um, uh, data in, in, a, in, a, in a systems type manager where we're looking at, at multiple networks. And so we can now target the mass spectrometer to look at it, as many proteins as we can within that particular network and do it that way. Which then leads us to say, well, we'd like to do even more, and we'd like to see even more proteins uh, that we can see, and so that's where we start to get in this data independent analysis. And, and so the importance now of not only spectral maps, but also reproducibility in terms of sample preparation and sample analysis becomes quite important. And that's where um, reproducible chromatography really steps into play here. It gives us these um, advantages where um, we can now uh, fragment multiplexed versions of peptides and we use our spectral maps to, to pull these things apart and then uh, and we do this also in a very quantitative manner which is really where the uh, reproducibility comes into it and so our advantages here is that it gives us our testable predictions um, it also uh, gives us high specificity high reproduci reproducible um, results it's also quantitative and it allows us to do our um, uh, very much our systems type analysis with multi-omic integration. So now we have more complete data sets in which we can uh, analyze uh, our samples. Now just stepping back, you know, one of the, one of the things we talk about proteome pipelines, I think everyone is familiar with, uh, you know, having to, to take your sample, fractionate that um, in some way, and then, you, um, then proceeding through to the, the mass spectrometer and then doing your database search. Uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks, though, is, is this uh, analysis component at the back end. And so even though you, um, you might have uh, good, robust techniques to get your sample to the mass spectrometer, it still requires reproducible uh, mass spectrometry that uh, it really uh, enables you to then do these more targeted approaches. But then it's also um, uh, using uh, computational approaches in which you can uh, then uh, take that information and, and convert that into, into results that biologists can understand. And it's this, this uh, component here 
where you could take two paths. One is to do this uh, uh, iterative uh, protein list generation, which can either be uh, stochastic if you're doing uh, shotgun mass spectrometry, or it could be uh, more targeted if you're doing a, a, a selected reaction monitoring or, or SRM or MRM approach, or even a, the data independent analysis. But if, if we look at some of the issues that we have with shotgun mass spectrometry, we actually see where uh, this starts to fall down a little bit. And so if we, if we uh, take a particular uh, set of uh, proteins in a sample and we digest those proteins, what we end up with is, is peptides that are unique either to that protein. So in protein A, you can see that, that at least we will get two peptides that are totally unique to that protein. Um, but if we have um, proteins B, C, and D, you have varying uh, 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 differences in terms of, of prototypic peptides, peptides that may be unique to that protein, but also peptides that could be shared amongst those proteins and then uh, also would not be able to be uh, used to identify that particular protein from the others. So B, C, and D would not have um, uh, would, would have peptides that would not be able to identify them uniquely, and so they could only uh, identify either that group of proteins or it could identify just uh, a, a set of isoforms that you could not pull apart. And so D is the, is the extreme case where it doesn't have any uh, uh, peptides there that you can u uniquely use to identify those proteins. And so as you go through, digest them at the peptide level, uh, create spectrums of those, of those uh, uh, peptides in a mass spectrometer and use a computational approach to come back is that you now have to make these um, peptide inferences. And not all peptides will give um, uh, quite a lot of information in which one can use an algorithm or even uh, use uh, uh, the information and calculate it by hand to actually uniquely identify that peptide. Not all peptides fragment the same. Not all peptides give full uh, fragmentation patterns. And so it makes it quite difficult sometimes. And so some peptides just fail to be identified. And so those, um, if, it's, uh, if it's only at one prototypic peptide per protein, then you would fail to identify that one altogether. And in others, then you have to make this protein inference component and sort of work out, well, which peptide belongs to who? And so that where, that's where you can start to identify the proteins that you're interested in, but also uh, misidentify those proteins by having those shared peptides being identified to the, to the wrong protein. And so that's uh, where we need to start to develop our technologies and say, okay, which is the, the best peptides to use? Which are the peptides that we can now rely on and uh, uh, routinely identify those proteins based on those peptides? And that's what um, we've been doing here has been uh, developing all the uh, fragmentation maps for each of the, pro each of the peptides of, of every uh, human protein plus other organisms and working out which are the best um, fragments of those proteins to to uniquely identify each of those peptides. And so in that uh, instance, what we can now do with that information is do this, this technology which we call targeted or selection reaction monitoring technology in where we can take those, that information, take those uh, peptides of interest and now target the mass spectrometer so we can uniquely only identify those particular components within a complex mixture. And we do this uh, using uh, um, primarily triple quadrupole mass spectrometers. And so in that instance, what we do is we program the mass spectrometer to look primarily at the, uh, um, the parent mass in the, in the first instance with a, a very tight uh, quadrupole um, uh, selection window, fragment that, those peptides with, um, that, that have gone through that first quadrupole by uh, normal collision-induced dissociation, and then we, we tune the third quadrupole to only look at um, peptide fragments that correspond to the, the transition mass or the fragment mass. And in that instance, we can now get a, a quantitative signal. And the quantitative signal that we get back um, is very much like a, a chromatographic peak. We can calculate the area under the curve and work out, um, like with dilution series, we can work out what uh, quantitation, what, what levels of peptide are there uh, through levels, uh, limits of detection, uh, also limits of quantitation. We can do those, those uh, types of uh, um, quantitation curves 
and, and work out how much of that peptide is actually in that particular sample and then work out the abundance of those proteins in the sample. So that lends us quite well uh, that kind of technology to do uh, uh, for biomarker type analysis. We can quantitate differences specifically with those, those peptides and then also um, program the instrument to, to do this in a multiplexed fashion as well. And this is where um, uh, reproducibility in, in chromatographic separations really becomes important. You need to have uh, um, windows in which you can program the mass spectrometer to only look at those particular peptides at that, that unit time. And so you need to know exactly when that peptide is going to loop time and time again. And so by having um, uh, changes in chromatography systems, uh, changes in, uh, in uh, tubing lengths becomes a real problematic area and so you need to be able to, to uh, control that so you can get uh, good quantitative peaks. And so with the, with the um, SRM type te technology or MRM type technology, um, it enables us to get two levels of mass selection here. One is high it gives us high specificity and so we can filter out most of the uh, other extraneous peptides that we're not interested in. It's not scanning and so it's uh, particularly uh, 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 fast in terms of its detection of that particular component, but it's slow in terms of trying to switch from one component to the next. Um, in, in that sense, it gives us very high sensitivity, higher sensitivity than we can get with uh, normal shotgun mass spectrometry. And it's also um, um, getting down to the very low atom mole uh, per level. If very complex solutions such as uh, plasma were in the in the uh, nanogram to, to uh, low microgram per mil level, so it, it, it does require some fractionation to get even lower than that. Um, but one of the, the main components is you really need to understand um, you know, you know, what those fragmentation patterns look like. And so uh, in that sense, once you have these, pep these peptide maps or these uh, peptide fragment maps, is it enables you now to, to uh, select any peptide and use it very much like a mass spectrometer's ELISA. So we have now websites where you can uh, pull down this information, uh, uh, select the peptides of interest that you want from the proteins of, of interest that you have, and then automatically program up the machine using these transition lists. And so it's this type of um, approach is what, what we're doing here. Um, and in the end, what we uh, um, get is a, is a very um, uh, sensitive method. It has very high specificity and, uh, and it's uh, perfectly lended towards uh, quantitative approaches. However, the limitations are is that there are small numbers of peptides that, um, that can be uh, analyzed and it needs to be done in a multiplex fashion, but it doesn't give you um, a capability of doing uh, a very complex amounts of, of uh, peptides or proteins that you're interested in, and you need to know how to do uh, the assays uh, beforehand. And at this point, um, uh, what we have been developing is these uh, multiplexed approaches or these uh, uh, very much uh, complex fragmentation um, uh, capabilities that we have now with uh, the triple top mass spectrometer. And this is where Sam will talk to you about what he's been doing in, uh, in, in that approach. Um, thank you, Rob, for uh, framing the question so nicely. And um, what I'd like to talk to you about is how to uh, take advantages of state independent an, uh, analysis and leverage uh, reproducible chromatography uh, analyses to, um, to analyze a whole proteome rather than a few proteins of interest. And so I'd like to first illustrate what the, the main difference is between data independent mass spectrometry or um, SWOTHMS is compared to uh, SRM. And if you look at SRM as, uh, as you use the, the, the mass spectrometer now as a filter, filtering first for a, a particular peptide of interest and then a particular fragment ion of that, that peptide. <coughs> um, uh, so if you, if you use first, uh, first a filter for the, the peptide and then a filter for a, a particular fragment of that peptide, then um, in order to expand the number of peptides you can cover, uh, you, can, you can open up the first filter and thereby allowing for multiple peptides to be fragmented at the same time and then use 
then record the entire fragment or all fragment ions of all these peptides at the same time. Thereby, you have uh, uh, essentially a multiplexed SRM approach that you can use. Now, you do have the, the capability to not only have a deep analysis, but also a broad one and cover a proteome uh, essentially completely. However, that comes with a, a certain requirement for the, the LC part because uh, what you do now is you, you go in these rather complex fragmentation spectra and you uh, extract, you, you essentially make a, a, an extracted ion chromatogram on fragment ion basis and you look for coelution of these fragment ions in order to identify your peptides. So. Um, in order to identify the peptide, you, you do need uh, five to six data points across the, 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 chroma, uh, the, chromato, um, the uh, chromatogram uh, in order to identify the peptides. So you, do, you still want to have sharp, narrow, and, and tall peaks, but uh, you have to be careful that the, these peaks are not too narrow, otherwise you will really lose uh, a lot of IDs. On the other hand, by opening up the, the filter, um, you allow multiple peptides to uh, fragment at the same time. You also risk that uh, two of these peptides share the same fragment ion. So um, you, you lose the, the connection between the fragment ion and its precursor. Uh, and there is where the, 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 a good liquid chromatography comes into place because if you can separate the, these, these peptides with uh, potential interferences, if you can separate them uh, using the LC, uh, you, can, you can circumvent that problem. One example for such a problem is, for instance, if you have a, a peptide that can be modified, the, the modified and the unmodified peptide share quite a bit of, uh, of fragment ions that, that you record, uh, but with the with a powerful enough uh, chromatography, you can separate them and you won't run into the problem that uh, these, uh, these two peptide species interfere with each other. The, um, the data-independent analysis has the advantage that um, by fragmenting all the peptides that are in your sample and in your uh, uh, master charge range of interest, uh, it essentially creates a digital map for your sample. I'd like to take the time to uh, illustrate uh, how that's beneficial. By, by recording all the digital features for every, for every object, um, by, by, re uh, by recording um, all the digital features for, for every object in your sample, it allows you to essentially create a database or to, to uh, to build up a catalog of all the, the, the chemicals that are in your sample. And thereby, you can easily navigate through your sample given the, 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 the right tools. And so um, it, can, it can be, uh, uh, be envisioned that you just generate such a, a proteomic map once and then use that as a community resource rather than everyone creating these maps over and over again. But in order to serve as a, as a community resource, um, you really have to have the, the, your setup uh, to perform as good as it can. And that's not only true for the mass spectrometer, but also for the LC part. Because as I uh, pointed out earlier, you, uh, you do need good chromatography for the uh, identification. Um, additionally, what you need is, uh, you also need the tools to navigate uh, through these maps and not only a, a resource to have, these, um, to have these, these, these maps available to the community, but also, uh, also the, the software tool to, to navigate through them, as well as a library that uh, contains um, let's say the, like the coordinates for these peptides, where they elude and what, what fragment ions best to use. And I'd like to uh, first, uh, I'd like to illustrate to you uh, how such a, uh, an ion library looks like. And in there essentially contains the information about the fragment ions. So 
which, which uh, master charge ratio they have and what uh, intensity ratio can be expected for them. But it also contains the retention time for these peptides that you can, you can focus your analysis on the, on the time when, you're, you're, when the peptide eludes. And um, while it has been established how to make these, these spectral libraries essentially from shotgun ID and, and use the, the, the multiple spectra that you acquire in order to come up with a, um, a consensus spectrum that best reflects the, the fragmentation pattern of such a peptide in, a, in, in your sample, it should also be considered that the, the retention time plays an important role. Now, in order, in order to have a standardized retention time in your library from a single analysis is, uh, might not be that, that tricky because you just have uh, one elution point. But as you acquire more data and you build these, these, these libraries from, from multiple analyses, it gets more and more tricky because uh, now you have uh, a multiple chromatography you need to align uh, in order to have the, the best retention time prediction, that uh, the best retention time prediction um, available to, to then uh, leverage that information in, in your uh, subsequent analysis. Um, so the importance of uh, chromatographic reproducibility for a whole proteomic quantification is, uh, um, is, is really important for these targeted mass spectrometric analyses, and I'd like to give you here two examples. The, the first one is uh, essentially scheduled SRM, um, where the, it has been shown that the, um, by adding the retention time information to the assay, um, to the SRM assay, it, it gives you, uh, it, it is as beneficial for the, the, the specificity of the assay as to add an additional uh, transition. On the other hand, um, you do need the reproducibility because um, you only record your assay in a, in a particular retention time window, and obviously if the, the peptide doesn't elude in that window, you don't record it at all. Uh, the second example is uh, data-independent analysis, or SWOTMS, and in there you, you do record the peptide no matter where it, it eludes, but uh, by having a better uh, by having a better retention time prediction, it allows you to identify more of the peptides that, that you have in your library, and it also allows you to be more specific. So you don't, uh, you don't have the problem that um, two interfering peptides or two peptides with similar fragment ions might, uh, might interfere with each other. So how does the, the, the exigent non-well C400 system help you with, uh, by achieving these, these results uh, more efficiently? And on one hand, this, uh, this system is a U, uh, UHPLC system, so it can handle uh, pressure up to 10,000 psi. Uh, and this is, this is especially useful if you want to use uh, smaller diameter particles or longer columns. Additionally, it, uh, it can be uh, used together with a, a, a chip system, and it's also compatible with self my column. So you can really use it the, the way you, you, want it, uh, you, uh, you want it to use it. So this one here is the, 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 the box that yeah, takes the, the, chip uh, the, the LC chips. Um, additionally, uh, it comes, or one version is a, a, a two-pump setup, uh, so you can you can also do um, two D two dimensional liquid chromatography and thereby really fractionate your sample and and, and dig deeper in the in, in your sample. The the sample pickup of the, the LC is really fast and that makes it good for having a, a higher throughput so um, analyze uh, more samples. And um, what I also think is, is very uh, convenient with that system is it, it saves the pressure profiles. So in case you have problems with one of the, the, the sample, you can go and, and, and go back and really pinpoint which of the samples uh, cause the problems uh, in case it's uh, um, visible in the, in the pressure profiles. Um, the advantages of a, of a chip-based LC especially for longer term studies is, is really uh, uh, on one hand the convenience 
it is uh, uh, it, it, it's really easy to use. It's easy to change the, the, the columns, and you don't need to to, play, uh, to uh, handle these small these small uh, uh, connections anymore. And uh, and but still, you you, you get uh, you get good connections. You don't have to worry about them. And it minimizes the, the dead volume. It's really uh, uh, it's it's really a nice setup. On the other hand, you, you get you get very good uh, reproducibility as these uh, these chips are in a standard format. So you always have the same traps. You always have the the, the same the same columns. Um, so if if you have a long term study and you need to change the column between between samples in that in that same study, you uh, you're sure that the the column is still the same. And it's not only the 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 column itself, but also really the the retention times are really reproducible from one chip to the next. That's uh, that's something that um, always can cause some problems if you make your own columns. The the setup that we have here at, at ISP is a uh, an exigent nano LC um, 425 with a chip system. So we have the the, the system with it uh, with two pumps, and we uh, in general use it in a in a trap loop setup using the the, the chips with a, a 15 centimeter column, and. Uh, we will. We, uh, we are starting right now to uh, to go more into the, the two-dimensional liquid chromatography, um, also using the uh, the chip setup. Uh, we have the the LC system connected to a, a triple top 5600, and for the, the users uh, using that that setup, um, I think they will um, they will like the the fact that um, in case of the triple top, you have a, a calibration method. That uh, that calibrates the instrument or maintains the accuracy by uh, looking at the uh, by by looking at particular ions that elude at a particular retention time. And now, by having a, a chip system with reproducible uh, retention times, you don't need to update that table anymore. You can just use it. You can just really change the chip, and, and that's it. Uh, the the calibration will pass. Whereas with the uh, uh, with self-made columns, um, at least what I did is I, I always checked if the retention times are still the, the, the same. Um, so I'd like to show you here uh, some, some examples for the, the reproducibility that we see here at ISP. And uh, what I show you here are um, stacked individual runs for uh, standard peptides, <coughs> standard peptides that um, were uh, acquired in between uh, samples, in between runs, that uh, we use to evaluate the consistency uh, for of the, the retention time. Uh, what you also see here on the on the right hand side is uh, the same six samples as an overlay, and you really see how the the, the uh, you really see the the, the the reproducibility of the the, uh, the retention times. Of these these runs, um, but now I also like to show you a bit more uh, in in a broader perspective, and this is the, um, essentially the same uh, the same setup. So in this case, we uh, we use the same the same peptides in a in a longer term study, again between the samples, and it it, it has a nice uh, uh, reproducibility of the retention time with an RSD in general of, of below 0.4 percent. And uh, which allowed us to, to confirm the the, uh, the, uh, the standard retention times, um, but you not only want to have them between runs. So uh, whenever possible, what we do is we use the peptides. We we, we spike the peptides in our sample. And uh, what I show you here is the um, the elution profile of three of such anchor uh, peptides. That we spiked into different OGE fractions. Uh, OGE stands for uh, off-gel electrophoresis, and um, whoever has done that kind of fractionation uh, knows that the fractions are uh, quite differ uh, are quite different in terms of of, um, of complexity, and they can be really complex to uh, only contain uh, or not so complex. 
but you still see that uh, the, these peptides, or the three that I show you here, show a really nice uh, uh, coelution profile, even a, a reproducible uh, retention time profile, even between these uh, very different sample process, uh, sample matrices. Um, I'd like to show you here a bit uh, more than just the three peptides, and this is the, the same standard I used before. And you can see that uh, even uh, on the on the whole uh, uh, in in a whole set of OGE fractions, uh, in this case it was a, a, a clinical sample that we that we analyzed. Um, it it maintains this this uh, uh, the, the the retention times, and this is also important not only for the analysis of of clinical samples, but also if you want to have a, a deep proteome sequencing and generate these spectral libraries such that uh, you, you can rely on, re uh, on your retention time, that it's not just uh, that particular OGE fraction that has this, this retention time, but it, it's, it's essentially the retention time of that, uh, that peptide, which, may, which, uh, which makes it really a, a, a nice uh, system to work with. And um, with this, I'd like to to summarize uh, the, the presentation, and um, I hope I could convince you that the current targeted mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry methods really benefit from uh, the reproducible chromatography, and that the, the Exigen Nanwell C400 allows you to achieve uh, such good chromatography, and that the, uh, the chip system uh, allows you to, to a reproducible uh, allows you reproducible uh, chromatography even in, in long-term studies, even between, uh, even when you change uh, chips and, and columns. Um, I think uh, with that we conclude. Okay, thanks uh, Sam very much and also Rob for, for the interesting presentations. Uh, so again, I'd like to remind the uh, audience that it's you can type in questions in the question box. There's already a few questions that came in and I will start asking those. Um, the first question, um, Sam Rob, is what type of sample preparation do you, do you typically use for these type of samples in, in this workflow? So um, we have uh, uh, multiple, uh, multiple sample preparation protocols that we uh, routinely use here, and it's more of like the, the question that we ask uh, behind that. But the, um, in most cases, what so what we use for, for lysate is, is a general uh, um, chips and digest of the, of the proteins and then uh, a C18 cleanup of these peptides um, in order to have a really clean sample for, uh, that, that goes on, the, on, the, on, these, uh, on these chips. And uh, in, in some cases we also, as, as I, uh, I showed here, we also do um, fractionation on, on the peptide level. Okay. Uh, here's a question that I can probably best answer myself. So the question is if the uh, nano LC chip LC system can be used with other MS systems than AB Sykes mass spectrometers. And so it, it can. Uh, we, we, the system can also be used with any thermal mass spectrometer. The uh, integration into the Excalibur software from Thermo is, uh, is pretty much the same as, as the way it integrates into the analyst software from AB Sykes. Um, let's see, another question is, um, Sam, you mentioned uh, that, that you're going to look into using online multidimensional uh, HPLC for these assays. What type of first dimension separation are you thinking of? So uh, um, what I'm really interested in is, is using uh, helix chromatography, um, but uh, we might also look into the, uh, uh, an RPRP approach that uh, has been shown to be uh, uh, giving a very good results with that. Okay. Then another question uh, from the audience is if there have been any published validation studies using this workflow. So that's maybe a question for Rob to answer. Yeah, so the, for... Um, uh, Targeted SRM, MRM, there's, there's a number of publications that uh, have already been um, described uh, out of there. Um, we have a couple of publications with collaboration with Rudy Abbasol that have, that have come out with some nice, sub, nice studies. 
Uh, in terms of the SWAT technology, um, again, Rudy's been a, a pioneer in this field and has uh, published two papers so far and, and we're uh, um, in the process of, of both publishing uh, um, uh, workflow methods, both um, our group and, and uh, the other group at, at EDH are also doing the same. And so these, uh, these are um, a number of, of different examples of, of the workflows that we've um, put through and, the, and these are coming out as, as, uh, as we um, submit them. Okay, thanks. So another question, maybe a little bit harder to answer here, is uh, what configuration is better for whole protein analysis, a QQTOF or a triple quad? So if you're looking at a whole protein analysis, are you talking about um, uh, top-down type approaches? And if it's a top-down type approach, then you're going to need uh, you know, something in the, in the, with a you know, high resolution component, and so the triple top would be um, more suitable to that approach. Um, the triple quads are, are, uh, are particularly suited to small peptides, small molecules, that kind of, that kind of effort. And so the MRM type approach has been really lent from the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry, which has been doing this for many years, uh, looking at, uh, at, at the drug compounds. But uh, now applying that to uh, peptide levels, uh, we can we can do that quite readily uh, with with uh, a peptide in the range of somewhere between seven and, and, and the maximum about 30 amino acids um, is is usually applicable there. But for larger um, components, then you'd be looking at uh, triple quadrupoles to look at. I mean, your uh, triple tops to look at uh, your proteoforms. Okay. Another question is, uh, how much protein do you typically inject for a complex sample? So how much less material would you inject by nano-LC versus conventional UPLC with, say, a 2.1 millimeter column? Um, so what I usually use is, or I aim for uh, about one microgram, and I, I, I usually go less than that, so say uh, 0.5 to... Uh, um, uh, 0 0.5 to 1 microgram for the, the nano LC. Um, now for a more uh, using using um, columns with a uh, with a, with a bigger bigger uh, diameter, um, you obviously want to go higher, and you can analyze up to 20 micrograms using a 2.1 millimeter column. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question here is if if you could comment on the. Um, effects of uh, ion suppression uh, in, in these type of workflows on quantitation? Yeah, so, so one of the things that um, um, we've been uh, developing here is, is to try and minimize the ion suppression as much as possible. It's that certainly when you get very complex um, mixtures of peptides going through the mass spectrometer at one time, you start to, to realize that you do get some ion suppression. So you need to fractionate as much as possible. Um, by having uh, you know long gradients uh, and uh, um, efficient chromatography, you get um, quite good fractionation, which minimizes any any uh, uh, ionization that's occurring at that time. You also remember that when you're doing uh, quantitative approaches, um, if you're also having the, the capability of, of doping in uh, a stable isotope labeled peptides, that you can account for any uh, ion suppression that's occurring. Um, especially uh, when, you're, when you're looking at more targeted approaches, that becomes uh, quite useful. Um, with the more of the, uh, the whole protein, the, the SWAT type approaches, it's surprising how well uh, you can, you can uh, do your quantitation and it doesn't really um, become that much of a problem that, you, that we notice uh, specifically from sample to sample. Mm -hmm. So this question, I think I can answer is, the question is, it seems like chromatographic retention times would depend on temperature. Do you see retention time variations with temperature? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely retention time will vary with, with column temperature, but uh, one of the features of the uh, chip LC uh, system is that the uh, both the trap chip and the column chip are temperature controlled. So that way we uh, maintain a stable retention time, even if the uh, lab temperature was vary quite a bit. So another question is, um, is it makes, does it make sense to, to calibrate the chromatography, like, for example, is done in glycan analysis using standards? 
does that really benefit more, or is the reproducibility that you're seeing uh, without doing this without doing this chromatographic uh, calibration sufficient? Well, we calibrate um, the chromatography quite well with our peptide uh, standards that we're using, and so th that enables us to um, choose gradients that will be flatter in the in the in the more uh, complex regions. And you see, you know, sometimes when you when you look at at uh, say organic solvent ranges of about um, seven to ten percent going up to uh, twenty percent. That becomes a very complex uh, region, so you can flatten out the gradient at that point and get um, um, you know a better separation there. And certainly at the at the front end, you you know we don't start at uh, at a zero percent uh, organic solvent. We start up at three or five percent, and then and then we we start to flatten out. But then we get to the the back end of the gradient when you get these very hydrophobic peptides. Um, then there's no reason to, to continue on the gradient at, at a very linear range there. You can you start to climb up there to, to not only uh, sharpen up those peaks but uh, also end the, end the gradient as well. And so you do, you do uh, um, uh, have the capability there to uh, change those gradient shapes to, to best suit the samples that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question here is: um, Is there any benefit of using a C18 a zip tip cleanup prior to a C18 column trapping and separation? Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's twofold. It's, it's always a vexed question of: um, Do I do the sample cleanup and uh, and risk losing some peptides, or do I not do the sample cleanup and then load everything on the trap and then um, possibly? Uh, you know, minimizing the lifetime of my trap by loading on extraneous compounds um, from my sample preparation uh, that, that is going to uh, eventually wear out that trap because there could be a lot of lipids going on there, things like that. So, so one of the things that we do do routinely is do C18 cleanup. Um, that, that becomes part of the, the sample uh, processing pipeline that we use. Uh, you always got to try and, uh, um, you know, choose the, the C18 cleanup um, columns as best as you, you can to suit the sample amount that you have. And it does benefit from uh, um, having uh, much uh, cleaner samples going into the, into the system. And then you get that final uh, polishing of those peptides on the trap and then going onto the column. So there's always, you know, um, depending on the, the types of samples that you've got, and depending on the, the process that you use for your sample preparation, uh, you're either just going straight from a, a, a digest of a, of a, a, a live sample, then you're always going to get um, a very difficult uh, sample type. So you really need to, to, to then put in your C18 cleanup to the front end. Mm -hmm. So this may be one of our last questions. May not be so easy to answer, though. Um, the question is if there is like a protocol that that could be provided uh, um, for for both sample prep and 2D nano LC run. Maybe a protocol that that you typically use for doing whole protein analysis in human serum. Yeah, that's like that's a that's that's a tough one, and uh, yeah. you know, we 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 all we all uh, struggle with that uh, that component because you know, plasma. Uh, blood samples is always one of the more, more difficult um, types of uh, of samples to, to have. Um, it has a, a, a very um, uh, deep uh, dynamic range, and uh, it's also loaded up with uh, with um, uh, lipids, and uh, it makes it quite difficult to to deal with. And so, one of the things that we routinely do here is that you we do um, use a uh, like a, a, a a top um, protein depletion column, whether that be uh, an Agilent Mars 14 or whether we use the Sigma IGY 14, and that's our initial step to, to go through into um, trying to minimize the amount of albumin and, uh, and, and uh, IgG that's there. And then from there, doing a, a fractionation. So our protocol would then be going into, um, say, an off-gel fractionation. Uh, at the peptide level, so we do the digest after the IG14, uh, do an off-gel fractionation there, and then that goes directly into the into the mass spectrometer from there. So you are getting like a, a, a you know a three-dimensional 
fractionation attempt there to, to go through. So that's our pretty standard protocol. Okay. Um, I think that kind of concludes the questions that uh, that came in from the audience. I, I do like to uh, kind of point out to the audience that uh, you will receive a uh, an email once the uh, entire webinar is is available online, and you can forward that to to your colleagues and have them uh, kind of listen to the webinar in case they've missed it and you think they would be interested. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, both both Rob and Sam.